It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, my only concern about this evening is that we have vastly more to talk about than we can possibly cover in an hour and 15 minutes, but we'll do our best. Um, there is a famous story about George Bernard Shaw who was once introducing an after dinner speaker and told him that he had 15 minutes to speak and the speaker said, well, how can I tell them what I know in 15 minutes? And Shaw said, I'd advise you to speak very slowly. <laughs> and, um, we are gonna try to speak very fast. As I'm giving my, my co-panelists uh, um, a notice so this we can cover as much as, as we possibly can. Let me, let me briefly introduce them for you. Um, on my far left, um, Hussein Musavian, an uh, old friend. He is a uh, Middle East security and nuclear policy specialist in the program of science and global security at Princeton. He's served for about 30 years in Iran's foreign service in many different positions, including as ambassador to Germany in the 1990s. He was editor-in-chief of the Tehran Times, and he's authored a number of important books and studies. Banafshe Ganoush is next to him, is a foreign affairs scholar, recently a visiting scholar at Princeton also. She has served as an adjunct professor for over 13 years, as a development officer at the World Bank and the Asia Foundation, and as an English-Persian interpreter, simultaneous interpreter in many different capacities. Um, she has recently authored a book that's highly relevant for tonight's discussion, Saudi Arabia and Iran, Friends or Foes. Fred Lawson next to me is senior fellow of the Center for Syrian Studies at the University of St. Andrews, past president of the Society for Gulf Arab Studies. He was pre previously a Fulbright lecturer at the University of Aleppo and was a visiting fellow at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in Qatar. Uh, Fred has written numerous articles and books, including Global Security Watch Syria and Constructing International Relations in the Arab World. So we, we have amongst the four of us um, uh, a lot of uh, different perspectives, a lot of uh, knowledge um, among my colleagues on the region. Let me try in 10 minutes to sketch, and it won't be any more than that for you, um, what I see as uh, kind of the outlines of the most important issues of where we are. Um, uh, and I start this story on May um, uh, 17th, a month ago, a little more over a month ago, uh, the day that President Trump left on his 10-day uh, trip. Um, he also, very quietly before he left, um, issued the wave, formal waiver of sanctions that he was required to do. That was the deadline day of May 17th. Uh, under the uh, what's called the JCPOA, which you'll hear a lot about in the next hour, the, the nuclear deal, that's the name of the nuclear deal. In order for it to stay in force, the president has to, on 90-day uh, intervals, attest that Iran is meeting its commitments and therefore sign a waiver uh, that, uh, to, to continue the waiver of, of sanct presidential sanctions. He did that. Um, the reason it was significant was that although the administration had not, as he promised, torn up this deal on day one in office, and although they had officially recognized and said that Iran had met its commitments under the deal, this was the first time that the president had to take an affirmative action. Uh, and the, a lot of us were holding our breath. Um, uh, a lot of people in Washington, a lot of people around the world, whether this would happen. It was done very, very quietly with no fanfare, uh, but it was done. Two days later, uh, Iran held its election, and President Rouhani was reelected uh, with a very resounding uh, victory, 57% of the vote, very high voter turnout. Um, his opponent, uh, a nationalist conservative cleric, um, uh, had he, had Raisi been elected, I'd say that the future of the deal um, would have been certainly cast into serious doubt. Rouhani's re-election, as was his original election, was very much a mandate 
uh, on the nuclear agreement and on the re-engagement with the world that it promised. Um, it was notable, I think, even though normally Iran's presidents are re-elected for a second term, but this was notable because the promised benefits of the deal, the economic benefits, have not yet materialized for the Iranian people. And so uh, this was still a, um, a staying with something that hasn't, that hasn't delivered yet from the point of view of, uh, of most Iranians. It is still a hope, and it was very resoundingly, um, uh, there was a clear, there is a clear public um, decision to stick with it, at least for now. Two days after that, President Trump delivered his speech in Riyadh. And that speech, excuse me, that speech is notable in several respects. It kind of created um, what many um, have been calling a new axis of good. Um, uh, this being Saudi Arabia and its its uh, Sunni allies, Israel and the U.S. And the, um, uh, the deal, the trade-off, was that the U.S. would be a lot tougher on Iran in exchange for which Saudi Arabia and its Sunni compatriot states would be uh, a lot tougher on terrorism and on cutting down on support and funding of various sorts and would collaborate with the U.S. in trying to deliver an Israeli-Palestinian peace. There are several things that are noteworthy about this speech. One was the president did something the U.S. has been working very hard through several administrations to avoid doing, and that was to take sides in a Sunni-Shia divide across the region. He very explicitly sort of wrapped his arms uh, around not just Saudi Arabia, but I'm avoiding saying the GCC because of the Qatar crisis, which we'll come to, I hope. But um, uh, it, there was very clearly a stepping over this line. Um, secondly, uh, noteworthy in, in the deal um, was a call for all nations of conscience to work together to, quote, isolate Iran. So what was particularly special about the Iran deal was that, and what, in my view, accounted for the fervent opposition by many Arab states and by Israel to the deal, is not the provisions of the deal itself, but the fact that it opened the door to the international penalty box to let Iran out after 30 plus years of sitting in the penalty box um, during the time that Iran, uh, off and on at least, pursued nuclear weapons and lied about it. Um, here the president was saying he did a kind of a slide from the reason for isolating Iran being a nuclear program, an illicit nuclear program under the non-proliferation treaty, to uh, now we're going to isolate Iran because of its behavior in Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. Um, i make a personal comment here. I know of no case in history where isolating a country improves its behavior. But um, uh, we will, we will uh, take that on as well. So um, uh, the third important aspect of the speech was the president's use of the word unquestioning friendship and then his description of it that the U.S. would no longer in any way concern itself with the domestic policies of its newly embraced allies in the Sunni states. This was, and this was very clearly stated and very clearly received because it took the government of Bahrain only 36 hours to move against its Shiite minority and uh, it took the Saudi Arabia only a little bit longer to launch this um, uh, uh, attack on, on Qatar. So um, uh, the president was saying, so long as you work with us on, on 
terror and against Iran. You can do anything else you like. And, uh, uh, and that, that was heard and, and received. So where do we stand? Um, uh, the administration has recognized that Iran has met all of its commitments under the nuclear deal, but they hate it. Um, and they have continued to harshly criticize it. So one of the issues that I would like my colleagues to comment on is, is the deal sustainable in, in those conditions? Um, can, you have, can you have an agreement that, that stays in effect um, uh, uh, under this um, kind of barrage of, of criticism? Um, we also are facing um, some critical moments in Syria um, for two important reasons. As the military effort against ISIS has comes to a close in Mosul and is pushing ISIS out of Iraq, across the border into Syria, and as the battle over Raqqa, the headquarters, ISIS headquarters, begins, or not just begins, but continues, uh, mounts, um, the question, two critical questions come up. One is, who will govern this part of Syria? It is inhabited by Sunni Syrians. They have no desire to be governed by Bashar al-Assad. They have no desire to be governed by Iranian-backed Shia militia. Uh, and um, uh, we have no desire for them to be governed by ISIS. So a critical question becomes, what happens if, if when the military campaign is successful in this part of Syria? The other critical question is that it has been a principal um, um, goal of Tehran for a long, long time to establish a land corridor that would link Iran to Lebanon so that arms can be delivered to Hezbollah by land. Now they have to go by air. Um, once ISIS is cleared out of this area, it this route lies open, and there becomes a very serious potential clash in interest between the U.S. interest and the Iranian interest in, in a long pursued interest, and and this is a is a particularly important one. Third, I hope we will be able to use um, uh, the special. Um, knowledge of, uh, of my compatriots up here to talk about uh, the most important bilateral relationship in the region, which is the Saudi-Iranian relationship. Um, I believe, at least, that there's little hope for peace in the region until there is some kind of accommodation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, we have new leadership in Saudi Arabia, and we should pay, uh, spend a minute or two talking about that. It's been a long time coming that we have finally got a generational change in Saudi leadership, and that's extremely welcome. And the new crown prince, uh, Mohammed bin Sultan, has talked about and should provide perhaps some important reforms in both economic and social uh, areas, but his foreign policy has been worrisome. Um, okay, so I um, have taken twelve minutes instead of ten. I, um, but uh, and I haven't mentioned Yemen, which is the most underreported catastrophe, humanitarian and otherwise, in the on the planet. Uh, Qatar, uh, which is probably the most unnecessary. Uh, new crisis that we have on our hands. Uh, I haven't talked about Turkey or Russia, all of whom are really critical to what we're talking about. And, and I hope in the Q&A that we will go where this audience wants to go in talking about some of what I haven't been able to, uh, to cover. But let me begin this conversation by asking my colleagues whether there's anything I've said that anybody would like to take violent exception to. You are the boss.
was all fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Or to add something to, why don't let let's start a bit. Um, Hussein, why don't we start? Talk a bit about how what how you see the future of the deal. Um, it, it, will Tehran stick with the deal even under uh, the constant criticism from Washington? Is do you see it as a as a a done deal, so to speak, as an irreversible commitment that's been made, um, uh, or how fragile do you see it now? I think first is extremely important to understand the deal. The deal is not between Iran and the U.S. I would mention three very important points about the Iranian nuclear deal. First, after 36, seven years, hostilities, animosities between Iran and the U.S., which they never negotiated directly. For the first time, Iran and the U.S. engaged at very high level negotiations at the level of foreign ministers, 2013. And in less than one and a half years, they could reach on a peaceful settlement and the nuclear crisis, which from the U.S. point of view was the threat number one to U.S. national security. Therefore, it's very important because this means diplomacy with Iran works. That's why Secretary Kerry has established an initiative calling Diplomacy Works using the model of JCPOA. And the Iranian Supreme Leader once said, if the US shows its commitment for full, correct implementation of the deal, this could be a model for Iran, US to discuss, to have a dialogue negotiation on other differences. If it fails, it means the door would be closed for any other further negotiation on other differences. <clears throat> Second, this deal was a model of crisis management through multilateralism. Because the US unilateralism, war on Iraq, war on Afghanistan was disaster for the region, for the US, and for the first time international uh, community, the big powers, they agreed collectively to negotiate one crisis through diplomacy. The world powers, the P5 plus Germany, six world powers they negotiated. Therefore, this is an achievement for multilateral diplomacy, which really today is needed for uh, addressing the other crises in the region. And the third one is consensus between all uh, nuclear scientists worldwide with no differences saying that this is the most comprehensive agreement ever achieved on non-proliferation because it has the highest standard of transparency, the most intrusive inspections, mm -hmm. and also closing, closing all pathways toward weaponization. This is the, 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 the most comprehensive uh, agreement ever created during the negotiations of nuclear non-proliferation. Therefore, this is a big asset for eliminating of nuclear weapons worldwide, global zero. Even if anyone is concerned about elimination of all nuclear weapons or nuclear weapon free zone in Middle East, this is the best model. What Trump is doing with bringing within this deal, the US and the world powers, they are all committed to facilitate normal economic relation and economic benefits of Iran from the deal, working with other countries, Europe. If the US does not want, no problem. But the US is committed not to block economic relation between Iran and the world powers. This is explicitly said. From the day one, <coughs> the US Congress started to introduce sanctions. You would be surprised, uh, 80 
legislations in six months, you know, more than ever between Iran and the U.S., just because one issue was settled through diplomacy. And Trump has imposed the government sanctions against Iran. Now it has created big fear. Uh, Europe, uh, Japan, South Korea, everybody is afraid of possible U.S. punishment, making business with Iran, practically is blocking uh, economic benefit of Iranians from the deal. And this is a big risk for the sustainability of the deal. Because if Iran is not supposed to, uh, to have a benefit, economic benefit from the, from the deal, what Trump and the Congress, they are doing, they are bringing the same sanctions under the umbrella of human rights, terrorism, and regional issues. Because they are not going to say, uh, we are, uh, they, they, they want to say we are not going to violate the nuclear deal. But what they do, practically, they, are, uh, they, they, they try to undo the nuclear deal through sanctions under the umbrella of human rights, terrorism, this is the reason, uh, Jessica, I believe, uh, if it continues, deal cannot be sustainable. And if Iran is supposed to withdraw, Iranians, they have fully complied with every commitment. The U.S. accepts all world powers. Everybody is concerned about the U.S. compliance with it, about it, its commitment. Europe is okay, Russia is okay, China is okay. Everybody is talking about the U.S. compliance. Therefore, if the U.S. is going to continue non-compliance, not commitment to the deal or disturbing the deal, playing with the deal, then Iranians someday would have to withdraw. Then what is the option on the U.S. table? Attacking Iran? Is the United, United States is ready to go to for another war? For, for what? Okay, let's let's turn a bit um, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Banafsheh, you've you've written a book whose subtitle uh, is Iran, Saudi Arabia, friends or foes? Question mark. I don't see much sign of friends. Tell us what you were thinking there. Um, if you look at the history of Saudi Arabia and Iran, you realize that. They've never really meant to be close friends, but at the same time, never also meant to be bitter foes. And uh, the fascinating aspect of the Saudi-Iranian relationship is all about maintaining a level of balance of power in the region between them as two major powerhouses in the Persian Gulf region. Now, um, as time has gone by, the United States, as we all know, has had a more um, impactful presence in that region. And as a result of US um, activities there, sometimes this balance of power between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the organic way in which they bonded as neighbors, has been disturbed and disrupted. For example, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, et cetera. So when I really embarked on this research to respond to your question, um, I was very mindful of the balance of power between these two countries. And um, I think that as far as long as they're neither bitter foes nor bosom friends, then it's all fine. Um, are they bitter foes? No, not necessarily, because um, if we look at the nuclear agreement, the example of it, um, the Saudis have come out quite strongly saying that they support the deal to remain in place because a stable Iran guarantees a stable Persian Gulf and therefore more stability around the borders of Saudi Arabia itself. This is a country, speaking of Saudi Arabia, that feels encircled by nuclear powers. There's Israel and there's an ambitious Iran and uh, lacking the same resources, although Saudi Arabia and its youth are now embarking on knowledge development and know-how and indigenous growth, even in the nuclear arena, you know, they, they do not wish to be a step or two behind either Israel or Iran. So a stable nuclear deal um, is fine in and by itself as long as Saudi Arabia and Iran are able to address some of the regional problems that you've touched on. Right, right. What's your sense about the new crown prince? I mean, he, he did seem to launch this venture in Yemen without a, uh, with perhaps a, an, an overly aggressive um, uh, approach to, to 
both the fighting and how easy he might be thought it would be. Is it, uh, where is he taking the country? Do you think? Well, first of all, we can all sometimes be young, and um, you know, decide that we want to do something more more rapidly. Uh, I remember in my 30s, I was more prone to that than I am now in my late 40s. But having said that, um, I think it's important to look at the history of Saudi Arabia and Yemen. The history of Saudi Arabia and Yemen is not one that can be defined or shaped by one individual. Uh, it's a very complicated terrain. Um, the two have been in sort of a low-level conflict since a very long time. They've had multiple disagreements. We know that in the 60s and the 70s, what's hugely disruptive to this conflict is not actually what we tend to focus on, which is the recent history, but what happened more than 10 years ago, the conflict, the disagreements internally in Yemen were not turning in, in a favor that the United States and the Saudis were willing to, to, to accommodate, and that created an opening for Iran's influence in Yemen over time, as we know over certain groups. So Yemen being Saudi Arabia's back door is a serious issue for Saudi Arabia, and um, uh, the Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman must manage that conflict as a backyard conflict. And the way the Saudis have approached Yemen throughout history is sort of uh, viewing it as a difficult terrain and therefore viewing their involvement there, not something that is supposed to be resolved quickly, but sort of over time. This turns Yemen into a war of attrition in some ways, and that is beneficial to Saudi Arabia in sa at some level, given how complicated the internal terrain in Yemen itself is. I want to invite all three of you to interrupt each other, um, and because I know there are different views um, on the panel, rather than waiting for me politely to call on everybody. But go ahead. I have Chris. a different view with Banafshe on Saudi perspective on Iranian nuclear deal, because the negotiation on nuclear deal started 2003. Now, hundreds of WikiLeaks documents are available showing, uh, proving that since 2004 till 2013, Saudis, Israelis, they have pushing the US to attack Iran, not to make the deal. Recently, just two weeks ago, Secretary Kerry in Oslo revealed a very important fact because this was the first time a very high level US official revealed the fact because somebody may say WikiLeaks document, no one can prove. Secretary Kerry publicly officially said, even during Obama, when Obama was serious for engagement, he wanted to resolve nuclear uh, crisis peacefully. Uh, John Kerry said Saudi Arabia was day and night asking the United States not to do the deal, attack Iran. And today, if you read Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, you see tens of billions of dollars Saudis they are spending in Washington to lobbies, paying everyone to bring new sanctions to undo the deal. Therefore, Saudis are, uh, have been from the day one against uh, peaceful management of Iranian nuclear deal, and they have been asking not to make a deal, just to attack Iran. I, I guess I think, too, that the Saudis have real misgivings about this deal. One set of misgivings is that in many respects, the deal simply kicks the can down the road. The deal stops any research for the next few years, but doesn't completely dismantle Iran's nuclear program. So, so the Saudis aren't sure that the deal is punitive enough or permanent enough for Iran to actually give up its nuclear research program. And secondly, I think the Saudis were extremely glad to have Iran be a pariah state and in a box and be completely outside the regional arena. And the Saudis are quite worried that this agreement might open the door to Iran being a legitimate player, an accepted player in regional affairs, which then really would pose a threat and, and pose a rival to Saudi Arabia. Um, in economic terms, in strategic terms. So I, I agree with you completely that the Saudis feel encircled 
they feel endangered, they feel like there are threats on every side, but I think the Saudis um, are not sure that this deal really helps Saudi Arabia's security very much. I th as somebody who's lived in Washington all these years since the discussions began, I, I can't count the number of um, conversations I've had with ambassadors from the Gulf countries where you really couldn't tell whether they were more scared of um, uh, of a nuclear Iran or more scared of an Iran that's having conversations with the United States. And, uh, you know, the region remembers the very close relationship between Iran uh, under the Shah and, the, and Washington and, um, and really fears of a sort of a snapback to that and that opening the door to the, the penalty box um, is tantamount almost to, um, there, there is a real ambivalence uh, between um, not having the deal and where we were headed in 2012 and having the deal, um, and it's sometimes hard to decide um, which which they dislike more. But let's turn for a moment, so we, because I'm mindful of the time, to Syria, um, uh, where we have a, a an astonishing catastrophe that's unfolded over the last um, five years and uh, uh, six years almost. And and Fred, talk a little about what you see as this. Maybe I'm too optimistic in saying end game, but uh, certainly end game vis-a-vis -vis ISIS and what comes after. Iran has certainly played a very important role in the last few years in Syria. Iran has provided training and material support and economic support to the regime in Damascus. Uh, partly because of this support, the regime was able to get a second wind and push back against opposition in all different ways. It's also helped dramatically that the Russian Air Force stepped in to play a key part in Syria, but the Iranian presence in Syria has really played a role in rolling back opposition forces of all different kinds. And now we do have this situation where there are generally pro-Iranian militias that are active in different parts of Syria, active in the area around Aleppo and helped the regime throw the opposition militias out of Aleppo, but even more active now along the border between Syria and Iraq. And it could well be the case that those militias that are very tightly aligned with Iran may set the stage for a porousness across the border between Syria and Iraq that we haven't seen in the last hundred years. That border was a real break point between the Syrian state and the Iraqi state. But the most recent news is that many of these Iran-sponsored militias are operating back and forth across that border, are doing their best to integrate different parts of southern Syria with parts of southern Iraq, and that would quite fundamentally transform the structure of politics in Syria and Iraq. So, so Talk about this question of a, that I postulated of a real head-on clash of interests, at least um, uh, as the as the pathway opens for this for an Iranian corridor across across Syria. What what should the U.S. be doing about that? One thing the United States might try to sit down and figure out is which side. Washington really has an interest in prevailing in the Syrian civil war. Does it have an interest in, in particular, in having the Kurdish national movement prevail? Does it have an interest in letting the Kurdish militias set up an autonomous zone in the north because the United States has drifted in that direction? I'm not sure Washington, you would know, I'm not sure Washington has made a conscious decision to back the Kurds, but the Kurds were the best of a bad choice. The Kurds were what looked like, perhaps, might operate in Washington's interest, so the United States has been supplying the Kurds with funds, supplying the Kurds with weapons, and as you all know in the room, this has driven the Turks crazy. The Turks are completely scared. 
that the Kurds will set up an autonomous zone, will provide a basis for radical Kurdish movements, and that this Kurdish entity in northern Syria will be much more disruptive <coughs> than the Kurdistan regional government in northern Iraq. Now, just recently, it looks like Washington has shifted its backing a little bit, looks to me, from 6,000 miles away in California. It looks like Washington has shifted its backing away from the Kurds a little bit and in the direction of some free Syrian army units operating out of Jordan on the other side of Syria. And that's where the United States and the free Syrian army may well run up against Iran because it's the Iranian militias that are operating down in the south. And it could well be that this roadway that you're talking about would go across the desert from southern Iraq through southern Syria to Damascus and on to Lebanon. And it's that Iranian presence in the south where United States forces, where United States allies might actually come into conflict with Iranian allies. So a anybody who thinks that they possibly understand the conflict in Syria and where it's, I mean, it just hasn't spent enough time on it because uh, it, the number of, of conflicting Kurdish groups alone um, is, is, uh, is mind boggling. I, um, I, don't, I do want to turn to, to the audience's questions. I, um, I, I don't want us to leave though um, the nuclear deal too quickly because I just want to remind people where we were in 2012. In 2012, we were talking about going to war with Iran, a country that is three times the size of Iraq. In 2010, there was an article published in the Atlantic uh, Monthly, um, very well sourced by Jeffrey Goldberg talking about how the Israel believed that Iran would reach the nuclear breakout point in six, within six months and that, they, that the Israeli government would not allow that to happen, uh, that they would launch war. And what the Washington knew, uh, the US government knew, was that this was a war that Israel could start but couldn't finish uh, for military reasons. Um, and so for two years, between 2010 and 2012, there was increasing discussion in Washington about the US. The US did not want to get dragged into the war in Israel's wake. Politically and strategically, that was the worst possible outcome. And so there was more <clears throat> discussion about the US taking the initiative. And we had, after all, been through a 10-year period where um, more sanctions were answered in Tehran by more centrifuges. And it, it, we had gone from a few hundred uh, up to in 2012, 2013, when the negotiations, the serious ones got started, up to 19,000 centrifuges. And um, uh, there were only um, uh, two really alternative outcomes. Either you continued that way, more sanctions, more centrifuges, more sanctions, more centrifuges, or um, you go to war. Um, uh, it, and I, I should say the outcome of the more sanctions, more centrifuges was that Iran would eventually become a nuclear power, um, a nuclear weapons power. Uh, or you go to war and um, or you decide you're going to live with a nuclear Iran. Um, uh, and, and, you know, that was the kind of conversation we were having, debates we were having in 2012. And so uh, I just don't want to leave too quickly um, uh, the fact that um, uh, President Trump in inherited a tremendous bonus to U.S. national security mm -hmm. in this deal, which... I think is arguably in real jeopardy uh, right now. Um, just, just for, for uh, you mentioned the report, Israelis, they were claiming Iran within three to six months would reach breakout. Mm -hmm. 
I have documented in my book, Iranian Nuclear Crisis, since 1990, every two years, Israeli officials at the level of prime ministers, foreign minister, secretary of defense, yeah. they have claimed Iran would reach nuclear bomb in one year or two years. Right. Since 1990, this is one. I'm really surprised everybody in the United States is concerned whether Iran would have peaceful right for uh, right for peaceful nuclear technology. Nobody is talking about 400 nuclear bombs of Israel. The only country <coughs> in the Middle East possess nuclear bomb is Israel. Nobody is talking about it. Well, Ed, okay. Uh, it, everybody is talking whether Iran would have nuclear bomb or not. Nobody is talking about 400 bombs. Well, I, I was going to bite my tongue because I thought I was the only person in the room who still thinks that Iran was not pursuing a weapons program. Yeah, I think Do you it, think Iran was pursuing well, a weapons program? The Iranian program? nuclear uh, issue really had a very, very, very simple solution if the U.S. was clever. Right after revolution, everyone knows, before revolution, the United States of America laid the foundation of a nuclear Iran. The U.S. gave carte blanche to Shah for enrichment, let's power plant. Let's not do too much I, I just back history. No, no. I mean, let's try to be. No, it is important to know after revolution, Iran decided to cancel mm -hmm. all nuclear projects. I just want to interrupt, if I may, to respond to your question about the viability of the nuclear mm -hmm. deal. I believe strongly that in the absence of an alternative uh, solution or scenario, the deal will remain in place. And so far, President Trump has not taken drastic measures to undermine the deal. Um, I also want to bring to attention, if I may, um, the interests that countries such as Israel and Saudi Arabia have in keeping that deal in place until or unless an alternative solution to containing Iran further is, is reached. Uh, uh, the issues that you discussed uh, earlier about the Saudi position, valid or not, uh, you know, I'm not privy to those internal discussions in Saudi Arabia, but I can tell you that there are different voices in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and um, the message that they bring to the United States is not always the same message that they feel must be done at home at the same time. The Saudis have to balance between their interests in the region and with the United States. Uh, so does Israel. So, so far, this deal will remain in place. Let me, um, several people are asking a kind of uh, uh, for us to spend a little more time on, on what we think the administration's direction, plan, goal, intent are. Um, and and I hear I hear the the answer and I share it. Um, there has been a lot of uh, of talk, writing constantly in the last several weeks about a strategy. The U.S. needs a strategy in the Middle East. Well, before you have a strategy, you have to have a goal. And um, it's not clear to me anyway. And I'd love to know if anybody else feels differently. Um, uh, in a very serious way, uh, w w what the goals are. I mean, clearly, one goal is um, that at least part of the administration thinks the deal should be kept in place because it is inarguably working, and they hate it. And they would like, uh, there are certainly efforts to create friction uh, with Iran, and 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 that's that's a problem. But does does anybody have a sense that it, in trying to be sympathetic to the administration, what what goals do you perceive? Well, it's fair to say I think that the current United States president puts a high stake on personal individual relationships, right? I mean, whoever shows up, says something nice says something halfway interesting to this president, gets this president's attention. And who was, th uh, I don't know who was exactly the first foreign 
leader to visit Washington, but one of the very first was Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who now sh turns out to be an extraordinarily influential figure inside Saudi Arabia. So maybe it's not too surprising that the relationship with Saudi Arabia, the intimate connection with Riyadh, jumped out at this president in very first weeks in office. Practically what we have is uh, what uh, Secretary Tillerson said they would support regime change in Iran. It means the U.S., the new U.S. administration is going to go back to old U.S. strategy for regime change confronting Iran. Before the election during campaign, Trump said he would not be after regime change. This is a big shift after he's in White House. During the campaign, he said uh, uh, he's not going to go for wars in the region. He publicly said we were bucked down. He blamed Bush, Obama for increasing uh, uh, military intervention of the U.S. in Afghanistan, Iraq. Publicly, you heard all about. But now, practically, his policy is more troops in Afghanistan, more bombing in Syria. He is attacking Syrian government uh, <coughs> military base. He is attacking. Uh, he is going to send four more four thousand uh, American soldiers to Afghanistan. More support for Saudi Arabia to attack Yemen every day, killing hundreds of poor civilians in Yemen. Therefore, more bombing, more military intervention more confrontation, pursuing regime change. This is, this is clear evidence of Trump uh, policy in the Middle East. If, I'm, if I may just very quickly, and to be fair to President Trump's administration, every U.S. administration, you would know better than I, comes in with a period of trial and error. And in fact, this trial and error can go on for the first three years, as far as I'm concerned, looking at the U.S. politics. So President Trump's administration is no different. Mm -hmm. I've raised this to caution countries like Iran that they should not just sum, or, sum up, if I may, uh, Mr. Musavian, Dr. Musavian, uh, you know, the sum total of the Trump presidency about being about regime change in Tehran. I believe both the administration, the Saudis, the Israelis, while they are raising the stakes with Iran, at the same time are sending signals unless Iran is willing to sit down with us and negotiate a fair deal in the region. So there is that caveat that I believe revolutionary Iran, although it must be prepared, Tehran, to protect itself, that's understandable, must not miss those important signals. I'm surprised really, Banafsha, you know, since 2013, Iran is inviting Saudi Arabia for dialogue. The US tried, Saudi Arabia declined. Russians tried. Riyadh's decline. Europeans tried, uh, Saudi Arabia declined. Publicly, the real king in Saudi Arabia is Mohammed bin Salman. Everyone knows. First, he said, diplomacy with Iran impossible because Iran is Shia. Publicly said. Second, publicly he ruled out any negotiation dialogue with Iran over, uh, over the regional issues. And third, publicly he said we would take the fight inside Iran. Can you imagine? And then after a short time, we had ISIS terrorist attack in Tehran. Iranian foreign minister every month has proposed Saudi Arabia GCC for a dialogue, for a forum for a dialogue between Iran and GCC without any condition, any precondition, to discuss every con concern the, 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 uh, uh, the, the parties they have. The only country is declining is Saudi Arabia. Bahrain is just now a, a province of Saudi Arabia. It's not a country, unfortunately. Otherwise, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, they are pro-dialogue with Iran, but Saudi is blocking. Then now you are saying Saudi is inviting Iran for, to come for negotiation? Iranian foreign minister, again, just, just uh, the day before yesterday in Berlin, 
called Secretary uh, Kerry tried a lot. Americans, they know. Saudis, they said, we are not going to negotiate with Iran. And this is public statement of Mohammed bin Salman saying, saying we are not going to negotiate with Iran because Iranians are Shia. Let we me, are going let to me, take the fight inside Iran. Let me use that as a segue because we have a, a lot of questions on the Sunni-Shia split. Where does it come from? What is the risk for the U.S. as I, that I'm sure comes off my comment, what is the risk for, of taking sides, taking sides in this case with the Sunni side? Um, and what does the split portend for the region? Fred, you want to start? I mean, this is something I think everybody probably has a... Has, has yeah, but do we always have to do this? I mean, Sunni Shi. So what's the most interesting split in the region right now? The most interesting split is on one side, Saudi Arabia and um, some of the smaller monarchies and countries of Northeast Africa and so on, and Egypt. And on the other side, Qatar, Iran, and probably Turkey. Now thinking about the region in religious terms, doesn't help us understand that split very much at all. There's nothing religious going on here. This is a strategic, this is a security dynamic, and I agree completely that the Sunnis often picture some of these things as being religious in character. Perhaps it reflects Saudi Arabia's view of the world, thinking about the world in religious terms. But for us, trying to make sense of what's going on, the religious stuff is pure overlay, makes no real difference to determining how these dynamics work. Saudi Arabia has a significant Shia population, ill at ease with it at times, Bahrain, Qatar, or just name it. Um, it's all about geopolitics. It's never been about the Shia Sunni divide. The US media has just made a nice wording out of it. And I wonder why those nice wordings didn't emerge before the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Mm. Um, we tend sometimes to explain some of our own mistakes in the region by blaming the region for pre-existing problems. And you know, for those of us who've lived in the region, Shias and Sunnis, yeah, there are sometimes troubles, but you know, we've, we've lived together. So that's my take on it. It's, as you say, all about geopolitics. All right, I, I fully agree it is not at all about religion. First of all, Saudi Arabia is not representing Sunni world. They are representing Wahhabism, which is 5% of, of Sunni world. Big countries look at Egypt, other countries, Shafi'is, Malikis, Hanafis. They are different with, 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 with Saudi Arabia religion. Therefore, they are not talking about Sunni world, one. It's, it has nothing to do with Shia Sunni at all. It's okay. all about geopolitics and also about political Islam, Jessica. Qatar is Sunni as Saudi Arabia is. One of the conditions uh, Saudi Arabia now has put on table for Qatar cut the relation with Hamas. Hamas is Sunni, it's not Shia. Therefore, the, the issue really is, is not about religion. Here's a question that is worth, um, that asks why is the U.S. was and is so afraid of a strong Iran? Who would like to? Oh, that's a big venture. <laughs> what has been the U.S. policy during last 60 years in Middle East? The U.S. has called for democracy for 60 years. Practically, the U.S. has supported dictators, corrupted regime, from Mubarak, Shah. Therefore, this is one. If you want to understand the, the, the practical U.S. policy in the Middle East, they have never supported democratic movements in the Middle East. Today, the U.S. allies, Saudi Arabia, zero democracy, zero human right, no constitution, no parliament, no election. At the same time, the U.S. is selling $350 billion armed to Saudi Arabia because this is perfect democracy. 
perfect human right, right? <laughs> this is one. Second, the US policy has been oil for decades. This is the reality. As long as Shah was there, a dictator, totally at the court of the US, the US had no, no problem with Iran. The day Iran made the revolution to be independent, removed a dictator, the US problem started with Iran. Because the US does not want to see independent countries in the Middle East. If you are at the court of the US, as you said, Jessica, at the beginning, they have given carte blanche domestically to Saudis, whatever they want to do, just to, to, to be with the US. If you are with us, perfect. If you are not with us, you are against us. This is the story about Iran US. Why can't Iran and Iranians leave Israel and the Arabs alone? This question asks, Iran does not get much love back by supporting the Palestinians cause, and most Iranians have resentments towards Arabs going all the way back to the beginning of Islam and the invasion of Iran. I, I will just say in, in reading this question uh, that Hussein and I did an event last night in the Iranian American community, and I was really struck at the um, unanimity in the room hmm. uh, of hmm. uh, anger towards Iran's government uh, for its, the hmm. depth of its involvement um, in, in the Palestinian cause. Do you want to hmm. comment on this? Surely part of the reason is the Iranian revolution happened a very long time ago, 1978-79. But when the Iranian revolution happens, it happens in the context of very close relations between the state of Israel and the Shah's regime, and very close relations between Israel and the United States and the Shah's regime. So from the very beginning, the Iranian revolution is not only against imperialism, but is against Zionism as well. So let's say at its heart, let's say at the beginning, at its birth, the Islamic Republic of Iran is committed to overturning Zionism as part of overturning dictatorship, as part of overturning the secret police in Iran, and so on. And I think that leaves a, that has left a real legacy, and it tempted the Islamic Republic to line up with the Palestinians. Why does Iran care about Palestinian liberation? Well, it's sort of a consequence of being so firmly committed against Zionism. And that's been going on a long time, but more important, has lain at the heart of the ideological, cultural fabric of the, of the Islamic Republic. I but, know this but, but at the end, Jessica, at the end, the reality is that after 60 years, with the US leadership, the solution acceptable by the uh, international community is reached as two-state solution, right? The US, Europe, Russia, China, everybody has accepted, even Arabs, two-state solution. It is Bibi Netanyahu who is rejecting. Why you are blaming Iran? Of course, Iranians, they do not like two-state solution. But the, 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 the obstacle is not Iranian opposition. The obstacle is the prime minister of Israel declining a two-state solution. Yeah. But everybody well, is blaming Hezbollah Iran for what? Hezbollah have helped. But Israel, the, here's a different question related. Israel is the only nation whose existence is threatened specifically by Iran, the PLO, and other neighbors. So what should Israel do other than what it is doing? <laughs> Stop building, building settlements would be... Um, uh, my answer, but I don't know if anybody has. There is a natural bond between Israel, Turkey, and Iran, historically speaking, as Dr. Lawson would also be aware of it, by way of them being the periphery states of the Middle East versus the core Arab states of the Middle East. These are three states that are the most powerful, have had incredible armies, and have an identity besides Islam that defines the nation. By virtue of that, as we know, Israel and Iran were in fact allies for much of the history prior to the Iranian Revolution. While I agree with Dr. Lawson's remarks that traditional alliance 
plays into the current geopolitics. Yeah. While Israel and Iran have been at each other's throats most of the time, it does beg the question why they haven't attacked each other for the past 36 years or so since the Iranian revolution. So one must really put that into perspective and recognize that a level of periphery geopolitics is also at play in defining the Israeli-Iranian relationship. So how, um, uh, we haven't talked about Russia at all, um, how does the new administration policy, as, as I described it, uh, likely to affect Russian interests in the region? It might increase the Russian presence and influence. How so? Anybody? Well, I think that in general countries like Russia, Iran itself included, where there is um, a gap in, in U.S. strategy, often tend to step in and fill it, in, fill it up. And Russia, I think, has gained some prestige and gained some notability for being willing to intervene in Syria, for being willing to take an active part in a struggle that Moscow felt to be important to Russian interests. And by actively intervening in Syria, Russia has become a player again in regional affairs. Russia built some bridges to Saudi Arabia, has built even more bridges to Iran, Russia has managed somehow to juggle a little bit of opening to both of those adversaries in the Gulf. And so the, um, uh, the opening that Russia has is one that may have long-term consequences. What is, what is, is all conflict between, so, uh, between Russia and the U.S. about? The U.S. has multiple military bases in the Middle East in Persian Gulf. Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, everywhere. Russia has only one in Syria. And the US has done everything to dismantle Syria. And Russians, of course, they have only one military base in the whole Middle East. And the Wait US has many. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This what is has really the US behind this What has the US done to dismantle Syria? The US just, I, I, I hope you, you heard interview by former prime minister of Qatar because the U.S. Trump blamed Qatar as the source of terrorism, right? Right. Saudis are uh, now claiming uh, Qatar is the source of supporting terrorism, right? The prime minister of, well, uh, of Qatar came to the uh, a talk show just a week ago, said, look, the reality is Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, with the U.S., we all supported terrorists in Syria. We had a base in Jordan, we had a base in Turkey, weapons, money, we all together supported these terrorists, and we all made a mistake. And Joe Biden, the vice president of the U.S. at Harvard, publicly said the problem with Syria is our own allies, he named Saudi Arabia, Emirates, and Qatar and Turkey. He said they are providing tons of weapons and tens of billions of dollars to bring regime change in Syria. It is the US Vice President and this is the, the Prime Minister of Qatar. It is not Iranian claim. Well, I'm sorry, forgive me, but the former ambassador of the United States to um, Syria even came out and wrote an, uh, and wrote, gave, gave an interview and also explained a little bit about the sort of behind the scene U.S. interactions with who to fund and who to arm. And uh, the countries in the region debated with the United States when that funding actually occurred, with the United States saying it occurred much later than some countries in the region believe. Um, having said that, I just want to fast a course correct here. It's not always the Saudis who lead the U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Syria. A lot of times Saudi Arabia being a modern state, a weaker state with a weaker diplomacy follows the United States in the region. And so, you know, although it remains debatable who started the Syrian conflict first, we, we really have to keep these perspectives in mind. Is it really uh, Yemen uh, the case? Uh, let, let's move in on. In Yemen, the, Saudi Arabia Hussein, is following the move. U.S. or U.S. is following the Saudi? Well, we don't have this a is you, no, This I, is Saudi military uh, strike and the U.S. is supporting. There's lots of things that that U.S. that countries. That, I mean, Qatar plays both sides. There's plenty of things that the U.S. Um, uh, and Saudi Arabia disagree on. I I I would 
caution people against against uh, um, assigning to the U.S. everything that other parties that the U.S. has relationships with in the region. Um, but I, I want to change the focus a little bit because this is a very interesting question which asks what the demographics of the region tell us about the future, thinking about the countries in, that have especially large, um, uh, very young uh, populations in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, and in Israel. Anybody want to? Young is uh, good. <laughs> young is good. Young is also difficult. Um, it, uh, Jessica, uh, the whole narrative of Trump administration, Saudi confronting Iran today, you have heard a lot, is claiming that you uh, Iranians, they have hegemonic policy, aggressive policy. First, we really need to understand the realities, not to deceive American public opinion. Iranians have not invaded any country during the last two centuries. This is the reality of history. For 200 years. Oh, wait, are you talking about demographics? No, I'm just coming to demographics. Okay, well, come quickly because we have just a few minutes left. Then the war against Iran was by Iraq, supported by Saudi. The war in Libya, GCC, Saudi Arabia, NATO. The war in Yemen, Saudi Arabia. In Syria, what Fred, you mentioned, the reality in Syria is that Saudis, Turks, with the US support practically, mistakenly, they, they orchestrated, recruited tens of thousands of terrorists sending to Syria to bring regime change. 60% of Syrian land is in the hand of terrorists. Therefore, we need to understand really who is making mistakes. Attack against Afghanistan, Iran had nothing to do. It was US mistake. Oh, okay. Attack, it changed the, the, the geographic and democratic. I mean, no. what happened? The US attack on uh, Iraq, the US <coughs> attack on Afghanistan, Saudi attack on Yemen, recruiting tens of thousands of terrorists to Syria. All is about the, the, the problem today we have created a, a heaven for terrorism. Everybody just blaming Iran. Now, okay. what can well, be no, done? I, I do want, okay. No, what what wait, can wait, be wait, done? Wait, 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 let's, thing let's to say would be that, that Saudi Arabia and Qatar were very much involved in recruiting and supporting some of the very early militias. 2012, early 2013, and then Saudi Arabia discovered it was getting burned, discovered that those activists didn't stay in Syria, but they actually came back to Saudi Arabia, they threatened the region, they were out of control, and both Saudi Arabia and Qatar scaled their involvement back in Syria quite dramatically. In so there was a moment of Saudi involvement but then Saudi Arabia has kept its hands off. Most of the youth in the region is reform-minded. In the absence of civil society contacts among the Gulf countries, the Persian Gulf countries, including Iran, unfortunately, politics will sort of take center stage. Um, but, but I think we need to seek opportunities for the young in these countries to talk with one another. And at the risk of say, saying something much too broad, surely the young people in Iran and in Saudi Arabia, in the countries that aren't devastated by war, are interested in material life and cultural life and a lot of this ideological conflict and a lot of these political struggles are something these young people don't pay too much attention to these days. I mean, these people would like to have a job and an education and, and an iPad uh, rather than <laughs> going off to fight for Islam a in job Raqqa, and God A job us. in particular, right. Several people have asked, and I want to try very quickly to answer, um, varieties of a question on was the Iranian nuclear program actually real? Or was it a strategic bluff, the way Saddam tried to, um, uh, to bluff about his WMD programs? Um, uh, was it, how come we bother about Iran, but not Israel, India, and Pakistan? There, there are a number of these questions. Um, let me just quickly try to answer it was real. 
Um, it did change over time. U.S. intelligence concluded in 2007 that the Iranians had stopped their weaponization program several years earlier. Um, they reaffirmed that finding several times after 2007. I would say that we actually don't know uh, whether a decision was ever definitively made, uh, whether it was made and changed, whether um, uh, factions were split, uh, not unknown in this country, um, whether, uh, the, whether the goal was to do the so-called Japan option, get right to the brink but not go over. Um, uh, maybe history uh, will, will tell us at one point, but certainly there were many years when Iran was violating its commitments under the NPT. And that's the difference between the situation with Israel, India, and Pakistan. Jessica, and, oh, there is just a, a minute, let me just finish. Um, uh, and yeah. that there were activities going on that are incompatible with the civilian, were going on that were incompatible with, or could not be explained, with a civilian program. Um, uh, so let me, um, uh, I'm not sure whether we have time to just um, uh, to, to try to deal with one more, but there, there were several people who were interested in the impending IPO of Saudi Aramco. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and what Saudi Arabia's economic position is and what this enormous potential IPO uh, signifies and how it will affect the Gulf. Um, who well, would like well, to? Well, the new crown prince has made its reputation partly on being a military commander and leading the Saudi intervention in Yemen, but secondly, on being the modernizer of the Saudi economy. And the plan called Saudi Arabia 2030 has been his plan to bring Saudi Arabia into a market-oriented, private enterprise oriented, not dominated by oil oriented economy. And in order to do that, uh, the plan is to create employment for Saudi citizens as much as possible and try to get rid of some of the expatriate workers working in the country, but also to scale back the state involvement in the local economy. And so opening up the private sector, creating uh, new private companies out of the old state-run enterprises is a crucial part of this Saudi 2030 plan. And so certainly part of this goal is to at least consider privatizing the crown jewel of the Saudi economy, which is the oil company. I'm afraid that we must close. Um, I want to thank everybody for the questions, for their interest. And please, uh, I, I'm sorry, we, we, have a hard, a we have a hard stop. Whether Iranian nuclear program was fake or real. There is a book written by Gareth Porter, a former CIA member, Manufactured Crisis. He has documented everything, why the Iranian nuclear okay. dilemma was manufactured by the U.S. and Israel. I um, want to thank everybody, um, my, my uh, colleagues on this panel, and all of you. And I, um, I do apologize to everybody whose questions I couldn't get to, but thank you for joining us.